If you're the kind of rider that's always striving to learn more, or maybe you're a new rider and you want to get started with all the spark notes you can get, I made this for you. This is the video I wish I had when I started riding. Many of the things are little details you may not even think to ask, but there are things that I was shocked I didn't know sooner. Hey, it's your doodle on a motorcycle. I've got my laptop here because I have a lot of notes for you today. And honestly, I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't know a lot of these things earlier. So I've been riding for about five years now. And if you're wondering why I just posted a video a few weeks ago that said I've been riding for four years and now I'm saying five. I, got, I took the MSF course in November 2015. As I'm recording this, it's the end of September 2020. So I'm three months shy of that. So I guess technically it's like nine divided by 12, three out of four, right? 4.75 years. I did it all in my head. So just a heads up, if you've been writing for a really long time, some of this may seem really basic to you, but hopefully you can still learn something new or just know what kind of things it's good to pass along to the noobs. So probably one of the most important lessons that I think I've learned are if you don't use it, you lose it. Keep training well after your initial riding course. That's why I love watching MC Rider for road strategy, for um, just setting myself up on the road safely. For example, making sure I'm not in anyone's blind spots, uh, making sure no one's in my blind spot, making sure I don't switch to neutral and then just lean back and relax at a stoplight. Um, just making sure I'm always ready just in case some freak show comes sliding into a collision course right on me. That's why I love watching Moto Jitsu and Jerry Palladino for some of their slow speed skills tips. And also just like, just kind of things you wouldn't think to ask, like where to put your helmet <laughs> for just a second. I can't believe I only learned that a few months ago. I took a lot of slow speed skills classes that was hard to say. For a few years right after getting my license, and it was shocking how many people had been riding for years, decades even, and couldn't even do a U-turn. They said that whenever they needed to turn around, they would find a parking lot and turn around. As I tell you this, I'm telling myself this too. How important, if you don't use it, you lose it is. I haven't been practicing these skills, and it shows. So hopefully I'll be right there with you in the parking lots on my list. Simple technique can make all the difference between what bikes you can handle and what bikes you cannot. One thing I'm talking about is my second bike was a Triumph Bonneville T100. Just about every time I got on that bike I either dropped it or almost dropped it. I barely rid it that whole year that I had it and I ended up getting rid of it because I thought I just couldn't handle it and I, I was also seriously considering maybe riding just isn't for me. Like, this is just too hard. Like, I'm just clumsy all the time with a bike. And that was before I knew some very simple things. Putting one foot down instead of both feet down, like dirt bike riders do. Y'all have been commenting and saying what country you're from and saying that one foot down is a requirement to pass your riding course. So people from Britain, Italy, Australia, New Zealand, Canada have all commented saying this, so I don't know. It, the MSF course here in the USA preaches get a bike you can flat foot when you first start. And I really don't know why, because I found that if I just did that one thing, putting one foot down instead of two and slightly scooting my butt off the seat, not only was I have I been way more stable, I also can can ride taller bikes now. I thought I just couldn't ride taller bikes. I thought that was just like a handicap for me, but apparently not. Apparently that's all you got to do. I raised my bike back to stock height once discovering that because I realized that I was very limited by not having this habit ingrained. And it's not like this is an advanced technique. This is something to mentally get used to. You can practice this today and be just fine by tonight. 
Once I raised my bike back to stock height, I was tiptoeing on it and I could no longer duck walk it in and out of parking spots. So now what I have to do, which I'm glad I know this now because this is how I, I can move heavier, larger bikes, which I wish I would have known that when I had my beautiful Bonneville. So that's okay, I'm, I still, I'm very happy with this bike. And that is to, instead of duck walking, to jump off on one side and lean the bike against your hip and walk it back and forth, holding the handlebars. That's how I do it. I usually just do the kickstand side because it's easier for me. Anytime I've posted myself doing one side or the other, comment section blows up saying, that's wrong, kickstand side is wrong, do it the other side. Or, that's wrong, non-kickstand side is wrong, do it the other side. So, just be warned. Also, I've seen people online doing it where you're parallel to the bike and facing it, and you have one hand on the tail and one hand on the front. I cannot do that. My upper body strength is just not there in order to do that. So, hip it is. If you're a short rider or you just want basic tips for riding a bike that's much taller and bigger than you, believe me, you can do it. I've saved a playlist, none of which are my videos. They're all just videos I've saved on YouTube. Some of my favorite videos that have been really helpful for short rider tips. And you can click that. I'll leave a link for that down below. A lot of these videos I've practiced, been practicing, or I plan on practicing soon. I learned this one the hard way. Gravel and your front brake are enemies. Pretty much anyone I know that rides that I've told this story knew exactly what was, go was wrong. I had no idea about this. I had been riding for probably a few months when that happened and I pulled over, put my front brake on and I realized front brake and low traction roads means you going down. Rear brake and clutch only if you're gonna be on gravel and, and you don't have off-road tires. I wish I had known this one. <sighs> Knowing very basics for taking care of your bike. And I don't even necessarily learn how to maintain your bike. I don't maintain my bike. I take it once a year to a certified Triumph dealership, make sure everything is in tip-top shape based on someone who is way more experienced and knowledgeable than I am. But what I do do I read my manual, there's a page there, daily safety checkups. I don't know who would do all those daily safety checkups every day, it's a lot. But I try to do them whenever I can remember. So checking your oil, that's really bad if you don't check your oil. Don't ask me why. Still very embarrassed I didn't know that a few years ago. Checking your tire pressures, checking screws, nuts, bolts, coolant levels, all that stuff. And I can't believe I'm even listing all this stuff. A few years ago, I didn't even know what any of this was. But just checking all those things because in, if you're in a car and something goes wrong, there's an annoying noise or you just have to pull over. But if you're on a bike and something goes wrong, I mean, there is no crumble zone. After my first bike catastrophe by 100% user error, I make sure to always read my manual and multiple times because I have the memory of a goldfish, but the repetition just helps me know things and remember. Um, and another thing is to maintain not just your bike, but also your gear from head to toe. Keeping it clean, keeping bugs off paint and your helmet, making sure your helmet isn't too old, especially if you get a helmet that's uh, like off the clearance shelf. So you can, most helmets have a print date inside underneath the liner and you can see if that helmet is maybe already two or three years old sitting in that shop. Some people will say you don't want to wear a helmet past five years because that's when its quality starts degrading. Now you will also hear that you don't need to be that picky, especially if a helmet's been three years on a shelf. That's not exactly three years in hot and cold weather outside every day. Just something to keep in mind. Also, I have one pair of riding boots. Those things are not cheap, but they've been very useful. I once dropped my Suzuki S40 on it on my foot and I didn't even notice. Now, if I had just been wearing cute leather boots or oh, sneakers, 
I mean, my ankle bone could have been shattered. No, thank you. Anyways, so apparently you can get a boot dryer, which that would have been good to know because four years of wearing the same pair of boots, they can get really stinky and you can soak them in vinegar water, air them out outside, soak them in soapy water, put baking soda in them, change out the liners, spray Febreze in it, and then finally soak them in OxyClean, and then finally they kinda don't stink as much. It's much harder to be preventative than to try and fix things later. Same concept applies to taking care of your bike. Did I say my boots? I didn't mean my boots. I meant a friend. Oh, this is a big one for me. Um, if you feel like you are moody and tired all the time, maybe it's because you're going into an office every day and people talk so loud when you're just trying to work, sometimes you just need to ride more. I hate when people say riding is therapy. Therapy is therapy. And I really wish more people would do it. It would make all of our lives so much easier. But riding sure as hell is a good distraction. I only very recently started commuting to work and that's in four years of riding on the days that I ride to work. I'm a different person. Normally I, like today I drove though. If I'm driving, I'm just thinking the whole time how much I don't wanna go into the office or I just wish I could be working from home. How I'm dreading the commute, dreading getting ready, dreading the, all the talking. I'm going to have to try to cancel out all day while I'm trying to work. But if I ride into work, that's a different story. I'm happy to be there. Well, I would rather be working from home. I just, I, I love the silence to work. Love the quiet but I'm in a much better mood, feel like I have more energy, like I just, I'm not as tired. I don't know, it's, it's a big help. And this one is very annoying, but I guess people are, they're well-meaning, but people who don't ride try to scare you out of riding. So many people that have no experience, none of their own personal experience on a bike, their only experience they have had is something memorable, like an accident that they've seen or heard of. So I'm sure you've already, probably already gotten this at this point, but anytime you mentioned riding or bikes to someone who doesn't ride, the first thing that triggers their memory is their Uncle Paul who lost their leg in a mo motorcycle accident. It's like, okay, thanks. I know when my sister found out that I was commuting on my bike, she was so mad. She's one of my older sisters and she was trying to tell me how reckless it was, how dangerous the highway is. And I told her, well, actually, statistically I'm safer on the highway. More accidents happen at intersections than on the highway. I still don't know how to respond when people um, get really anxious or tell me about Billy Bob that lost his arm and then tell me to be careful. So usually I don't say anything or I just say, I will, I'm very careful and that's it. Um, I hear this a lot is, how did you get over the fear of riding? How did you, how did you get the courage to do a track day or ride on the highway or ride to the mountains? Um, the truth is, I don't think I ever really did get over the fear. The more good moments I had on the bike, the more that memory outweighed the fear. The more I ride, the more distracted I get <laughs> from my own thoughts of fear or any kind of anxiety or anything like that. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think fear is a bad thing at all. I think it's your life, it's your bike, you do whatever you want. If you want to buy a bike to just yeah. ride it in a parking lot, do it. I say that because I know eventually you'll get sick of that parking lot and then you'll move on either, you'll just go full blown ham and get on the highway and head up to the mountain, uh, or you'll take it slowly like I did and then uh, move up to neighborhoods 
and uh, and you'll think you're a rocket the first time you hit 30 miles per hour. And then um, maybe you won't go on the highway yet, but you may be forced to go on the highway because you have a slow speed skills class you want to do and you're running late, but you've got to get to it. Yeah, so, but anyone who decides that they don't want to ride because of the fear, I will never fault anyone for that. I mean, that's a very logical decision and I will respect you for doing that. My fiance doesn't ride. He used to ride when we first were friends and he did for a while, but just decided that street riding was not for him. He doesn't do dirt bike riding though. And there are some fears you're gonna have that you're gonna feel pretty ridiculous that you ever once had, uh, like downshifting. I used to be horrified about the idea of downshifting. I'm pretty sure I did some mountain rides where I did not downshift until I stopped. Pretty sure I just held in my clutch going downhill. And I remember actually on the MSF course, I was scared to upshift too, because I had never driven or ridden anything manual. So I didn't shift up to second gear until the very end of the second day, because my instructor said, you are not gonna pass if you don't go to second gear. So I did, 12 miles per hour going around that little track in second gear was so, well, the most exciting moment of that year for me. Um, another simple thing, but that just took me forever to figure this one out was it's really easy to get gas on your tank and mess up your paint while you're filling up, but it's also very easy to avoid. So let me just show you. I did just cut 10 inches off of my hair pretty recently, but when I had when my hair was down to a little about my elbows, I had ways of styling my hair so that I don't get helmet hair. And I and my hair is not a tangled mess after I come back from a long day of riding. Um, the the main one I'll tell you is to get the racy baby do rag thing with a pocket for a big bun of hair. Um, I do have some other hairstyles in this video that you're looking at right now, which I'll link down below. But for the very best one, as far as no tangles at all, that's, that's the one I'd recommend, if not any others. And this one's for the ladies. It's not very easy to find gear that fits well and that you really like. It can take a lot of time, but it's not impossible. Ladies and riding are on the rise. We're at like 25% of riders in the US. I hope you can't hear that plane. Apparently I live like eight miles from an airport. I didn't know that. That's why this happens like every video. Gear. Triumph recently sent me a jacket. I think it's really cute and just fits really nice. And of course, no compromise on safety because I ain't about that. And there's this local designer outside of Atlanta who rides and she and her husband started a company where they, they make motorcycle jackets for women. And they're really cute. I have like, four of them, let me think. The red one, the black one, the leather one, I think that's it. Plus, sometimes there are ways to modify things yourself. I have done this on my own leather piece one suit. One piece leather suit. And I've also had girlfriends who have done a lot of track days in Florida and, through, and throughout the US, and this still works and that's a leather paint for your one-piece suit. I painted the hot pink accents on mine to be red, and one of my girlfriends painted hers, I think they were white, and she painted her accents gold. Her whole bike, she customized it herself, so it's, it's actually it's a street triple art as well, and it's all black and gold, it's, it's so pretty. And another friend loves pink, so she makes everything pink, including her track suit. And she's the one who does a lot of track days in Florida. And, and she sa says this paint has still held up for her. This was a new one for me. If you've never gotten headaches before, if you start riding, you might. But don't worry, this can be avoided. My first probably year of going on mountain rides, I um, needed to get on the high, I would ride on the highway for about two hours to get there. Pretty much every time I did a mountain ride, I came home with a migraine so bad that I would just go to sleep at like eight o'clock at night. 
Um, I had never gotten headaches before, so I didn't, I had no idea what to even take. But what I ended, I looked at a lot of forums and I ended up just trying all the things. So I don't know which one of these things did it or if it's a combination, but I'll just tell you all of it. One thing is to stay hydrated. I, I don't mean like have a glass of water. I mean like eight to 10 glasses of water a day and make sure you're hydrated even the day before a very long ride. If you think you can go on a long ride while you're hungover and extra dehydrated from alcohol the night before, think again. That and wearing earplugs on that long highway road. I guess that's it, just those two things. Lots of water and earplugs. Yeah, but after doing that, I didn't get migraines anymore, so that was nice. Another thing, if riding isn't your priority, you'll find excuses. If it is, you'll find a way. For me, the first four years of riding, um, it wasn't my number one priority. I would say it was fourth. If I had to compromise on work, or skip jujitsu, or skip something with family, including my fiance's family, I would usually pick that over riding. Which at first it was okay because I used to freelance so I had a much more flexible schedule. So I was still able to ride on a weekly basis. For the past couple of years, I've been working full time again, longer hours. So I've just run out of time for fun. So that's a big reason why I started commuting on my bike recently so that I could ride more. So now it is more of a higher priority. But some things I did was to try to be able to do it was, now don't make fun of me for this, but the coldest I used to be able to ride is 55 Fahrenheit. So I got a heated vest and heated gloves and now I could ride to about 35 Fahrenheit. <laughs> I know that's a heat wave to some of you polar bears, but that's cold for me. So now I can ride in a little colder weather. Really hot weather, I actually, I don't think hot weather really stopped me, but I, I did enjoy it less. But, so now what I do if it's really hot is, um, in particular, this was really good for on the way home from work earlier this year, in the summer, was I would just wet my shirt underneath my mesh jacket. It, this only lasts about 30 minutes in high 80s, 90 degrees Fahrenheit here in Georgia, but it was enough to get me home and not being all sweaty. Usually I was dry by the time I got back, but that made it the ride a lot more pleasant too. Someone had, I had, I did hear someone say to put um, ice cubes in your pockets and that'll last longer. I haven't tried that. I haven't been desperate enough for that. And probably one of my favorite things I've learned is that People who ride are some of the coolest people you'll ever meet. I definitely consider myself a recluse and like I just don't click with more, most people. I just don't have a lot in common with people my age. I mean, if you're a 31 year old girl and you love riding and martial arts and Star Trek, you don't listen to music, you just like podcasts and audiobooks or white noise, you don't really have much to add to the conversation. But when it comes to other people who ride, it's just instant connection. I've just met so many people that I really, really enjoy talking to and it's easy to talk to. When I first started commuting, I did a 21 days of commuting challenge. For me, it was a challenge. And um, part of the way through it, I had lent my bike to somebody who was considering the this same bike for their daughter. They dropped the bike. They offered to fix the levers themselves. Apparently they didn't know what they were doing. I, so my bike, I had to take my bike to the shop. It was just out of commission. I mean, it, my bike wouldn't even turn on. So I had, to, I had to take my bike to the shop and the shop was really backed up. So I didn't have my bike for several weeks. But someone on Instagram, who I had never even met, saw that I had posted that and saw that I was bikeless and offered to lend me their spare bike until I got mine back. They barely ever rode it anyways. They're going to be out of town for a while and won't be able to. And they'd rather it be ridden than not. So I had a, I had a bike from a stranger for while mine was in the shop. KTM, I had never ridden one before. And when I returned the bike, 
don't worry, I'm a good borrower. I made sure to clean it, clean and lube the chain, make sure the tire pressures were good. Actually, the, the clock was wrong, so I made sure to fix that. Just please, people, when you borrow something from someone, return it back in better condition. Not the same, definitely not worse, better condition. And I asked him if, if there was anything I could do to repay him. And he said, just pay it forward. If you meet another rider who needs help or needs something, help them out. Y'all read my mind because I had already been thinking this and then all of a sudden I started seeing comments on this. Yes, I will be doing an updated review on my baby updated long-term review. The last long-term review video I did on this, um, I don't think I had done a track day yet and I definitely hadn't commuted with it yet. Oh, and it wasn't at stock height when I did that video. And it just, it's, it's not a good video. It's not helpful. I was very focused on hair and makeup instead of being helpful. So it needs to be redone. So that'll be coming out soon. Updated long-term review. I really hope that other people watching this video who know more than me will comment below some things that you've learned in these years of riding that you want to share to others. Or if you're on YouTube, please make your own video too and shout me out. If you're new here, click this playlist right over here. Have I been talking for 43 minutes? Holy 